Tucker Talk. Here's your host, Jason Davis. Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Welcome into Soccer Morning. Here we go. We are live. We are on the air. There is no school, so we're dealing with that around here. Little Davis in the house, trying not to uh, <laughs> trying not to interrupt the show too much because then Daddy gets mad, and we don't want to make Daddy mad. <laughs> we are uh, we're going to power through here. Not not that it's a major problem. We've got a great show for you lined up for you uh, lined up for you today. Kristen Hennage, our good friend from across the pond, will join us to talk about some English football topics, including perhaps some stunning news out of. The United States. Yeah, you're like, okay, English football topics. Why are we going to talk about something from the United States? I'll get to it in a minute when I go down the news, but we're going to definitely touch on Liverpool making the League Cup final. Manchester United and their continuing struggles. How long does Lee Van Hall have in that job? Chelsea taking out Arsenal. Leicester getting back to the top of the table. So much to go over. Tottenham, how much is there discussed in the Premier League? Probably hours worth of stuff, but we will spend some time with Christian Hennage breaking it all down. And again, you got that American uh, American topic as well, uh, which I'm going to get into. Then we will push on and take your phone calls. And again, some of this new... Was I? Where, where, where am I supposed to pick up here? I'm not sure. Uh, can I go back over all of that, or, or should I, uh, should I keep going? I'm just trying to figure out where I'm, where I'm supposed to be. Okay. All right. Well, Matt Miazga is going to the Premier League. We'll leave it there. Uh, Tim Howard is considering a move to the uh, to MLS to join the Colorado Rapids. You've heard the rumors that the Rapids are interested in Howard. The reports that came out yesterday suggested that Tim Howard is actually interested. In the Rapids. Now, that may be because of the price tag. Sources indicate that Howard could make between 2 and $3 million as the goalkeeper for the Colorado Rapids. He would likely arrive in the summer uh, after finishing out the season with Everton coming uh, to, uh, to MLS at some point in May. Now, 2 to $3 million for a goalkeeper in MLS is a lot of money. Obviously, that's a DP slot. Uh, I get that Tim Howard has a name and a reputation and could put some people in the seats there at uh, Dick's Sporting Goods Park, but that seems like a very odd move for the Colorado Rapids to be making uh, when they have a competent goalkeeper in-house and they just traded away Clint Irwin to TFC. Liverpool beat Stoke yesterday on penalties to advance the League Cup final uh, at Wembley. Stoke leveled uh, leveled the uh, aggregate series at one through Marco Ar- Ar- Arnautovic, who, by the way, was definitely offside. Neither here nor there because Liverpool wins in the end. They struggled to create chances, did the Reds, but they managed to hold on until the penalty shootout. Simon, Simon Minule with a couple of big saves in the penalty shootout uh, to help Liverpool on to the final. Reports say that Jurgen Klopp, is, uh, Jurgen Klopp did not want to watch the, uh, the actual penalty shootout and avoided that until finding out that Liverpool had won. So there you go. Uh, couldn't watch. And this could be his first trophy with with Liverpool. So uh, certainly a big deal for uh, Jurgen Klopp. U.S. Women's National Team head coach Jill Ellis announced her 20-player roster for Olympic qualifying in February yesterday. Carly Lloyd's obviously on this list. Um, uh, Megan Rapino is out with injury. You know that. Hope Solo, Alex Morgan on the list. Sydney LaRue is not on the list because of her pregnancy, but Mallory Pugh, the 17-year-old who was going to turn pro and is now going to UCLA, is on the list. So a youth movement here, including Crystal Dunn, the uh, NWSL MVP from 2015. So lots of uh, good talent. Stephanie McCaffrey uh, as well uh, in this group for uh, Jill Ellis as they go into qualifying the biggest uh, absence, the most notable exclusion, Heather O'Reilly 
uh, who who worked very hard to get to this uh, point and make this team and was not included. We'll see what happens when the Olympic roster, the actual Olympic roster comes out when after the United States qualifies for that tournament. They do have to qualify, but we expect them to do that uh, pretty much uh, pretty much without breaking a sweat. Mexico plans to increase their scouting efforts in the United States in the hopes of finding more Mexico eligible talents to add to the national team program. Over 30 million Mexicans and Mexican Americans live in the United States, as you may be aware. And FMF national team director Santiago Banos calls this a priority to go find some new Mexican and Mexican American talent living across the border. Uh, in response to that, of course, we would suggest that U.S. soccer reinvigorate their uh, effort to find talent and keep that talent. Uh, here, not just here in the United States from a club perspective, but uh, absolutely with the United States men's national team program, um, if there is talent there to be had, and, and of course there is, uh, the uh, the head coach of Mexico, Juan Carlos Osorio, also spoke at the event in which this uh, new uh, this new initiative or this reinvigorated initiative was discussed, and he uh, he he ruled out Giovanni dos Santos from a friendly against Senegal in uh, on my on uh, in Miami on February 10th but opened the door to several other players uh, in the Mexico setup so that's uh, worth watching there uh, right now in Mexico the, the issue of naturalization is an ongoing topic that they are dealing with um, when it comes to the national team program all right so we've had this, uh, one hiccup let's hope we don't have any more let's talk to Christian Hedge when we come back about uh, England, about Matt Miazga. Where could he might where could he be landing? We don't yet know the team and how much could they be paying for him? 20 years old. Lots to look forward to. Soccer Morning, WorldSoccerTalk.com. Welcome back to Soccer Morning on World Soccer Talk with Jason Davis. All right, back on Soccer Morning on a Wednesday, and we've joined. Uh, we're joined now by our friend Christian Hennage, who joins us on the phone. He, he's joining us. You're joining us, Christian. How are you? I'm, I'm enjoying joining. All right, good. That's good stuff there. That's uh, it's, 
that's quality uh, soccer talk first thing in the morning for our audience here at the United States. Christian, um, I, I'm, I'm going to get into the league. I'm certainly going to get into the League Cup uh, semifinal that yesterday that, that delivered Liverpool into Jurgen Klopp's first final as, as manager of that club. But for an American audience, I think the lead is the, the sudden and surprising, somewhat surprising, I think we knew there was interest, but the surprising news that a transfer of Matt Miazga to the Premier League is imminent uh, per many reports. Daily Mail may have had this first, as a matter of fact, uh, backed up by, by several um, journalists over here. Do you, first of all, have you heard anything about Matt Miazga making the, the leap to England? And second of all, what do you make of this news? I had heard a little bit previously. I'd heard interest from, from Swansea, Leicester, Chelsea had a look, which, which surprised me, I must confess. In terms of, of making them, I think it makes a lot of sense for a, a Premier League club. He has a European passport, so you don't have to go through the, the rigours of a work permit like, say, Juan Agudelo. It's a good chance to, again, establish yourself in the American market. And assuming they've done their due diligence and they've actually watched Matt for a little bit, they'll see he is a talented defender with a lot of potential. So on a number of fronts, it, it makes a lot of sense. And that's before you even kind of factor in that MLS is a fairly competitive market to buy players from. You can get someone like Jeff Cameron, for example, for a very good fee comparative to other parts of the world and other leagues you might deal with. Mm. Uh, the, the, the Daily Mail reporting, uh, this is a $5 million fee. I don't know that what that works out to in, in pounds. Uh, Christian, you may have a better idea. I, uh, but th- th- that seems like a re- I mean, that that's actually seems a little high maybe for a 20-year-old uh, with one good season under his belt, but it's certainly reasonable when we're talking about a, 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 a player of his talent at his age. Definitely. It, it's about three and a half million pounds in, in Sterling. You've got to ask yourself, could you get that for a, a promising defender who would see your national team experience elsewhere? That's, that's almost what you have to kind of compare it to, as, as bad as that sounds, because I think we do still, to this day, buy a little bit on nationality, and that does a little mm-hmm. bit dictate how much a player will go for, even though it's, it's by no means a guarantee of success. I think for him, it's a good opportunity to move as well. Credit to the Red Bulls. Uh, I was talking to, to Mark Fishkin this morning. They've done everything possible to make him stay. They've given him the best kind of offer that they realistically can. And so I commend them for doing that. It's very clear, though, that, that Matt wants to try and sample Europe and, and push himself onto that next level. And I think you have to commend that ambition equally. It's a risky move, certainly. We've seen guys like Shea, Agadello, they've come to Europe, it hasn't worked out. It's felt almost like a waste of time for, for those two guys in particular. So it's fraught with risk. You don't get reward if you don't risk, though. And I think that's what, what Miazka is looking to do with this move. And it, it makes a lot of sense on, on both ends. So Matt Miazka, 20 years old, um, obviously a fantastic year last year for the Red Bulls. It leaves a hole for them. We'll maybe address that at a later date because they have to replace a talented young defender uh, in a team that, that won the support, Supporter Shield in 2015. But let's uh, let's move on and, and, and talk about the rest of the Premier League. Actually, what we'll do is let's focus on the events of yesterday um, at, at Anfield where, where Liverpool up a goal on aggregate against Stoke um, ends up having to go to penalties to beat Stoke. Now, I, I, the, the, the goal was offside, uh, Christian. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But there's got to be well, while there's some maybe some consternation over the performance, perhaps the the, the fact that they made a final and Jurgen Klopp uh, can can celebrate that achievement at this point is enough to to make Liverpool fans feel good about about where they're headed. Well, he's he's maintained his 100 percent record, Jurgen Klopp. He's advanced from all five semi-finals contested as a manager, so it's he's clearly got a history in in getting teams to that that final stage. It wasn't the prettiest game. I think we can both agree on that. Certainly, as you touched on there, you know, the, the goal for, for Stoke City was offside. In the long term, I don't think anyone will remember how Liverpool got to the final of the League Cup if they win it. And it's a good chance, I think, more importantly, just to boost morale a little bit with the end of the season. Because I, I think the, the arrival of Jurgen Klopp, it hasn't been as, as perhaps free-flowing or it hasn't brought the instant success that I think some people thought it, it might. I think a lot of people expected him to turn the, the football club around very quickly, and it hasn't quite happened because he needs to, to make some acquisitions, I think, first before he can really impart kind of his ideology onto the team. Winning the League Cup is a great way to just kind of mask that and take you into the, the summer with a, a little bit of positivity, 
allows you then to go out and talk to players with a, maybe a little bit more of a uh, an easier sell as, as as that can often be the difference between getting the great players and the good ones, as, as Brendan Rodgers found when he tried to get the likes of Alexis Sanchez and Memphis to play. You know, they also come off of that um, that that win over Norwich on the weekend, uh, away to Norwich, and the, the celebration from Jurgen Klopp losing his glasses. Um, you know, the, the guy's a, a cartoon character. That it, there's it's an inter- there's an interesting dynamic evolving in the Premier League now with him uh, having been here, f- having been in the league for a couple of months, and, and it's you know. F- from afar, when he's at Dortmund, I imagine it's very easy to sort of like Jurgen Klopp because of the passion, because of the uh, you know certainly he's a he's a good manager, but he's got, he's a big personality. It, it it seems to me that there's some 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 fan bases within the Premier League none too uh, none too pleased with Jurgen Klopp and his antics. Again, I, I think you can start to categorize this into a number of different boxes. Someone like maybe Jose Mourinho is a little bit more antagonistic, as an example. Do I think it's a bad thing? Not necessarily. I also think Klopp is, is a very passionate football manager, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to castigate him for showing that passion. And I think sometimes we can be a little bit stuffy in this country in terms of the way that we look at <laughs> managers and the way they act. I, I don't think he's being inherently disrespectful to his opponent, which is, for me, the only thing that should define how you evaluate this. So with that said, I think it's a storm and a teacup to be to be very blunt with you. I would agree with that. I mean, certainly. I, I mean, I, I can't put myself into the English mindset uh, when it comes to these things. But uh, you know, uh, a little bit of a little bit of passion is not a, is not a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. All right, let's uh, let's turn to the league here because again, Liverpool with a ninety uh, fifth minute winner to beat to beat Norwich. Again, it's it's funny how this is. You know, th- this is lipstick on a pig a little bit for for Liverpool. Just to stick with that, uh, stick with that team for a second, Christian, because you know th- they should be they should be better than than they are, or at least their expectations are they should be better than they are. So when you beat Norwich, you give up four goals. Certainly, there's some reaction that, oh my gosh, the the, the defending is is horrid, but you also won, so you, you get to move on with with sort of that enthusiasm that Klopp showed. It's amazing how one goal can make such a difference. If it's a 4-4 draw, then you know we, we lament their defence, we lament the fact that they went 3-1 down, all that kind of stuff. But because of that goal, it starts to just kind of let things slide a little bit. It, it lessens the curve, if you will, or the point. Uh, I think for them defensively, yes, there's still major issues there. Again, what I imagine Klopp would say if you asked him is that he didn't buy Dejan Love and he didn't buy a lot of this defence. So how how can he truly be judged on, on its input? That is something he will need to address in the summer, along with the goalkeeping situation again, which to me looks a, a little bit of a catastrophe at the minute with, with Bogdan and Mignolet. And then Mignolet getting a new contract again, which doesn't really make sense to me personally. So he's got a lot of work on in the summer. I think his midfield is actually quite set, I think, that looks okay. The attack, again, may need slight tweaks, but it's that defence, as you touched on there, that needs the massive overhaul. It needs essentially some quality defenders. I think it needs some quality defenders in the middle of the park. I also think it needs some help at fullback. I'm, I'm not seeing a real wealth of quality there either. Alberto Moreno has his good days and his bad days. He's clearly quite strong in, in an attacking sense, so if you can work on the defensive end, which is obviously what he's supposed to focus on, great. But on the other side of the pitch, Nathaniel Klein is solid. Who's behind him, though? You need depth if you want to achieve what Liverpool want to achieve. And I'm just not seeing that at the minute with them. So Liverpool in seventh place right now uh, behind West Ham, behind Manchester United. Manchester United, uh, another a, a club in a different sort of place, despite their better uh, place in the standings. Certainly Louis van Gaal, um, you know, it seems as though he's on his last legs. We had the story this weekend. Uh, Christian, uh, that that Van Hall had offered his resignation, and then Edward Woodward had turned it down, and then the club coming out and saying, "Well, no, Louis Van Hall actually never did submit a resignation." It, it's clearly going sideways to the point where something's going to happen, and it feels like it's going to happen soon. Definitely, I think I personally think he'll he'll see out until the summer. I think realistically, is there a great deal of, of use in sacking him now other than to perhaps destabilise things further as long as you've got a, a sniffing chance of getting the Champions League you might as well keep him around because the idea that again you could 
put Giggs in charge and, and fix things. I'm not entirely sure. Although, credit to Giggs, he, in his brief spell, he, he has, I think, a slightly better win percentage than, than Louis van Gaal. It just further destabilises things, though. I think you're better off getting to the summer than, you know, going for someone like Pep Guardiola or a major candidate and pushing that man forward and giving him the opportunity to build something. But right now, I think you have to just stick with Van Gaal, as difficult as that may seem, even if he's trying to force himself out the door. Now, obviously, it depends on whether or not Van Gaal wants to stick around. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy who's going to quit easily at, at this point. Um, you, you mentioned the, the potential to replace him with Giggs. That's, that's clearly the obvious thing to do, is to give Giggs the caretaker role until the summer if you do fire Van Hall. Is there, is there, so, is there a bit of a, a sleight of hand? And I think this may be somewhat true with Liverpool to a lesser extent. If you hire... You know, if you hire Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool, obviously uh, one of the most sought after managers in the world, uh, a, a, a big personality, a big character, someone who can, at the very least, bring enthusiasm to the club. And if you hire, if you give uh, Ryan Giggs the, the caretaker job at Manchester United, if you hire, uh, if you fire Louis Van Hall, then essentially you're you're buying yourself some time. They, at least for the, for, at least you could justify sort of well, we're, we're, we may struggle, but we're struggling for a reason, and it's okay because. We've got Ryan Giggs, and he's a club legend. You, you, know, you know what I'm saying uh, there, Christian? Yeah, I, I, I do see what you mean. I think, again, the, the difficulty is, is that essentially Giggs is, is arguably leading the, the blind himself. It, it's a difficult club in the sense that I think we always predicted the departure of Sir Alex Ferguson would leave a, a void that had to be filled, and it wouldn't be an easy void to fill. That's that's part of the issue. I think they need an identity. <laughs> That's why I, I kind of suggested Pep Guardiola, because I think he brings an identity with him. The, the, if you keep hiring managers like Louis van Gaal, I don't think you'll ever get the identity you need. You just no. get a scop gap. No. And that's really not what they're after. So few managers in the world that can be uh, the men to create an identity, uh, and some, some of them they're not going to want to, to involve themselves with. I mean, certainly we know that Jose Mourinho has coveted the Manchester United job, but I agree there's several people out there who are of the opinion that Manchester United is uh, forsaking their, their legacy, forsaking the legacy of, of Alex Ferguson, and forsaking the identity of their club and what they stand for if they hire Jose Mourinho. I'm not entirely sure. That sounds slightly, to me at least, revisionism in terms of Sir Alex Ferguson's. Uh, reputation because again he was quite eager to play the mind games he was quite eager to I don't necessarily I don't his, necessarily his mean and, that Christian I, I I mean in in the in the way that Jose Mourinho treats the jobs he has I, I, the Louis Van Hall was always a stopgap you you know that partly because of his age mm. so maybe this doesn't apply maybe I'm I'm going down the wrong road here but at least with Jose Mourinho he's young enough that you could hire and, and, and look there may not be a an opportunity to hire a manager who's going to be Sir Alex again, meaning you know, thirty years on the job or, or whatever it is, twenty five years on the job before he a actually steps aside. That may not ever happen again. But you, but if you hire Jose Mourinho, you are admitting that we've got this guy for two or three years, and then we've got to find somebody else. I'm not sure if, if that's necessarily true. I think it's true if you allow him to operate in the way that he has previously, undeniably. On the, the other end of that scale, I can't think of anyone who would last as long as Alex Ferguson. I think if you apply the same standard, you're going to end up disappointed because that was a different man with a different situation and a different time. What you have to do is you have to realistically evaluate the situation and say, okay, what is enough of us, what is enough time for us at least to develop the next chapter of this football club and what do we want to achieve and who will help us achieve that? Now, if they want an identity, Mourinho is possibly not the man to go with because I can't think of many clubs where he's actually fostered something that survived him. If you want to return to the elite and you want to win things and you want to be pushing for, let's say, Champions League, Premier League, etc., in the short term, he is the man for that job. It's no different to you know, yourself hiring someone for the, the show. You would go through their credentials and you would see what they offer and whether that fits the description of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. That's where I think Manchester United have gone wrong, is that essentially, as you say, Louis van Gaal was seen as a stopgap manager. They gave a stopgap manager a frightening amount of money. Yeah. You should really have been holding that money to whomever was going to replace him so that they could then build 
this idea, this ideology, if you will, not the man who's going to be there for two, potentially at most three years, because he's invariably going to waste it. He's not going to see, well, if I buy this player in, in three or four years' time, he's going to become brilliant. Certainly, that's how we're viewing Memphis now. I don't think it was how we were viewing him when he signed from PSV. I think that we were all viewing him as someone who should come in and make an instant impact, which unfortunately for him, he hasn't been able to do. No, he has not. So we'll, we'll see what happens with Louis Van Hall. Uh, perhaps, as you said, perhaps to him staying out, seeing out the season is the best thing to do for, for Manchester United. Uh, certainly this, this uh, story of the resignation or the, the, the lack thereof is, is, is confusing, uh, confusing things a little bit, but he does seem to be under siege there uh, at Old Trafford. All right, let's, uh, let's talk. Uh, we, we, we've got the flip-flop at the top again because uh, Arsenal goes and loses to Chelsea. And Leicester City gets a win over Stoke on the weekend to put themselves back top. To see the Foxes back at the top of the table uh, at, at this point, I mean, again, it's it's fairly remarkable. It, it is, and, and yet it's founded on such simple principles. It's founded on being organized. It's founded on being strong defensively and, and operating from, from back to front. And more importantly, being a little bit more free in, in the final third. I, I remember watching Thierry Henry talk about Pep Guardiola and, and the way he kind of set Barcelona up and how they had to remain incredibly rigid and in their positions until they reached the final third. And then they could operate with as much freedom and move to kind of wherever they wanted on the field. And, and that's why they were as deadly as they are. I see similarities with Leicester, and I'm sure Leicester fans will love being compared to Barcelona. So <laughs> you're, you're completely welcome. I, I think... What he's also done is he's, he's filled a lot of those players with confidence, the likes of Riyad Mahrez, the likes of Jamie Vardy. He's made them believe in themselves to, to elevate. Now, the, the curious thing with, with Claudio Ranieri is the first season is often quite good, if you look at Monaco, for example. The second season is normally when he tends to fall off. So I'll be very curious to see how these owners treat the summer because, again, they're incredibly wealthy. They will get a huge cash, cash injection from likely finishing near the top. Assuming they get in the Champions League, if we can for a second, they'll get another boost through that. And it raises the question, how much do you potentially destabilise the squad by investing in, in new, in air quotes, better quality players? That's a, a huge risk and a huge dilemma that they will face in the summer because simply from that one year, they will have players who maybe weren't picking up the phone and weren't returning those voicemails, now ringing them up, asking if they want to have a discussion about possibly agreeing a contract yeah you know that, that that's interesting that you're looking ahead i mean certainly they have a season to finish out here but based on their their their, their form and based on their staying power we, we expect them to at least finish in those champions league spots and and so the question for me and and you sort of addressed it there but let's go a little deeper christian is whether this is a transformative thing for a club like lester how how does lester let me frame it a different way how does lester Take this success, which, come on, they didn't see coming. Uh, they may have wanted to be there, but you, you can't account for this. Uh, how do they take that and, and then take the infusion of cash they're going to get from the Champions League berth and make it into something that's can, that, they can, that they can roll into you know, a five- or ten-year staying a bit of staying power? They may not win the Champions League. Sorry, they may not win the Premier League. They may not finish fourth every season. But if they can reach, I don't know, Spurs levels of... of at least challenging year to year, that would be huge for a club like Leicester. It would. And, and I think common sense would suggest you, you start by investing in your future, by investing in your academy, in your development squad. That's usually the pathway to success. You look at, say, Southampton, who've been able to, to bring in huge revenue streams from doing that. That would be my first call of call with that money, is, is to put some of it into that avenue. Then I think you have to, to ask yourself what kind of player are you trying to buy? Are you, are you looking for a more uh, development player, developing player in terms of a project like, say, Danny Drinkwater, someone who you bring from a big club who you know you can then elevate in theory over time? Or do you want to buy the established? Someone like Gokhan Inlet. The, the curious thing is, Drinkwater has worked. Inlet hasn't been able to get in the team because someone like Kante, who fits more of that first bracket, has been able to take his position. I, I think there'll be barrage with, with opportunities and offers to buy players. I would be inclined to try and keep the squad as together as possible and maybe just prune the edges and see if you can't provide competition for those players you've already got rather than trying to improve. Because I think that could potentially destabilise the, the group as a whole if, if they start to 
lose kind of who who um, who got them into that position in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a fascinating uh, conundrum to have. It's a, it's a bit like you know winning the lottery and then not knowing what to do with the money, how to invest it, how to how to how to make sure that you're set you're setting yourself up for life rather than blowing it all on the the Lamborghini or whatever. Exactly, it's it's, it's winning a million dollars. It's a lot of money, but it's not enough to live off for the rest of your life unless you invest it wisely. And that that is the conundrum that, that Leicester face. I think that the benefit or the positive they can take is that their scouting department seems to be incredibly talented. The fact that they were able to secure Mares, the fact they were able to to find, I think, Vardy is another good example. Even N'Golo Kante, another player who, whether you think you know it's, it's brilliant insight or not, they took the risk on those players and they're being richly rewarded for that. So you would imagine that Again, they can now open themselves up to targets that maybe they were aware of, but couldn't facilitate, be it financial reasons, or couldn't facilitate due to lack of player interest. Uh, let's uh, let's move on. So, so uh, Leicester top of the table right now again as they beat uh, Stoke City. Arsenal dropping back behind them by virtue of their loss. And and this is again, and this has come up. You know, I've had people ask me directly about Spurs. They're only two points back of Arsenal right now in fourth place. They're, they're targeting something, and, and, and there's enough of, uh, you know, the, the, the separation isn't so large that people aren't imagining that Spurs can make a run at the title. Certainly Arsenal's in play for that. We know Manchester City has got to be a favorite. But when Arsenal loses to Chelsea, okay, that's maybe not, it uh, uh, wouldn't be a surprise in any other year but this one. Um, and certainly we have the, you know, the, sub, the subplot of, um, uh, of Diego Costa and, and, the, and the red card and everything else. But when, when Arsenal does when they when they lose this game, is is, there, is it going to to bring up those questions again of sort of the, the the mental fortitude of that club and whether or not they have whatever that extra gear is to go and win the Premier League that they don't they haven't seemed to have since you know since the Invincible since you know for for a very long time now. I don't think it raises the questions. I think it answers them. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> quite truthful. I, I I think as you touched on there, the Invincibles. You look at kind of that whole period to me. Arsenal have gone from feeling like a group built on winners and those who will do anything to succeed to those who are now a project, those who have potential, those who eventually could deliver and thus far haven't delivered. I also think if you look at the relationship Arsenal fans have with the likes of Tres Fabregas and Sami Nasri, I think they hate them because they represent what Arsenal fans really want. They want winners. They want champions. They, they want these players who can deliver. And <clears throat> whether you think Fabregas and Nasri are terrible or brilliant. They have Premier League winners medals and they have them having left Arsenal. So I think part of the disdain they hold for, for players like Fabregas as they showed on Sunday is because he represents the mentality that they've lost. Mm. And part of having that mentality was him looking to leave to better himself to join Barcelona in the first place. If Arsenal could have offered him what Barcelona could, I don't think he would have left personally. I, I'm not entirely sold on the notion that he was that desperate to return to Barcelona, the club that he was quite happy to leave when he was a teenager to join Arsenal. Right. I, I think they have to fix that mentality. Though. They're not out of the race, but only because of the truly bizarre nature that is this Premier League season where everyone seems able to, to beat everyone and, and there's not a runaway leader. That's not to say that they're blessed with a million chances left. I think they have to really start to get things together now because you've got Man City there, who I don't think will be as kind of inconsistent moving into the final portion of the season. You've got Leicester keeping things up as well. Now is the the, the moment when you really kind of build your platform and, and extend the lead at, at the front. And Arsenal just seem to keep slipping up with the chances. If it's not Chelsea at home, it's Stoke, Stoke away. I think you can go back to the Southampton game when they were beaten 4-0 and say they haven't really played well since that game. You look at even the win against Newcastle, they for large portions of the game, they weren't the better side, and Newcastle were in the bottom three. So it's it, it's not as if they were facing some team on the up. This was a team they should have comfortably swept aside, and they struggled to do so. And certainly, and now when when we come to Spurs, it's the same sort of questions. Maybe a, a you know maybe a a, f a fraction less ambition, or not ambition, but certainly uh, less results over the course of the last couple of years. It's always Arsenal above. Spurs, it, 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 not only is there an opportunity here for Spurs to jump over Arsenal and finish ahead of their rival, but they also have an opportunity to get into the Champions League finally. Uh, but they lose Vertonghen. How big of a deal is that? 
I think that's massive. I, the the thing with him, I know people have said a lot about him and Alderweireld. They have experience of winning. That's something that really is vital when you're trying to achieve what Spurs are trying to achieve. They both kind of led teams in, in Ajax. They know each other very well on an international level, on a club level, having played together quite a lot. Destabilising that partnership is going to have a massive effect. And you could perhaps dip into the transfer market if you're desperate. I don't know if that really settles the issue because you're trying to replace familiarity and understanding. It's it's an opportunity for them to show how mentally strong they are as well. It's, it's I guess, somewhat ironic that they're both North London teams, while they hate what each other represents, they actually represent similar issues in, in the sense that I think they both have a mental frailty that has haunted them during the years. If it's if it's not Tottenham losing the Champions League spot at, at Highbury, it's them finding ways to, to choke when they've been close to it before. This is one of the better opportunities, if not the best, I think they've had in the last few years, in the sense that there's not that strength at the top. There's no one really cementing those spots in the top four very early in the season. Again, it's that mental pressure, though. It's it's the fact that they haven't really got an excuse if they don't do it this year. They've got a lot of talented yeah. players. They've got a little bit of depth now as well with someone behind Harry Kane and Son. They need to go out and do it. And certainly it's going to be difficult without Vertonghen. It's not impossible, though. And I think that's what they have to remember. Maybe they, maybe they get goals like Deli Ali's goal from the weekend every time out. <laughs> Helps them. <laughs> that's quite the stunning. Apparently it was worth two. <laughs> goal, of the, goal of the year for you? Uh, it's the one that's jumping out in my mind right now. There's, there's not many better, I must no. confess. Uh, it they... was fantastic uh, technique. The, the curious thing with, with Ali was he was actually quite quiet in the game prior to that. I had watched the, the game and he didn't do a great deal prior to that, which sounds like a criticism. I promise it's not. It just shows that you know he has the ability to spark something brilliant in a moment. And you usually say that's a sign of a potentially great player is when they can and turn a game on its head like that with, with a, a brilliant piece of skill. He's 19 years old. I mean, uh, you know, how much can Tottenham, and look, they, they, they've sort of ridden the Harry Kane train for some time now, and he doesn't seem to be fading. Um, you know, maybe whether he, he stays at the, at the, the same intense level is, is one thing, but he's certainly a, a good player who can score a lot of goals. Deli Alley at 19, how much can they rely on him to, to be a four, you know, whether or not he's going to score a wonder goal every time out? He certainly has a role to play in, in, in what they're doing? I think it depends entirely on his personality. Some players really thrive with that expectation. Others go inside themselves and, and really struggle. I was lucky enough to, to talk to Carl Robinson, the, the MK Dons manager, um, a few years ago, kind of before this move even was muted as, as potentially coming about. And he was very complimentary about Ali, as you might expect for a manager trying to to sell a prospect which is essentially what he was doing at the time but it never felt like he was exaggerating when he talked about his mentality and the fact that he had everything needed to go to the top and I think that mental side of things is, is again it's another important factor for him I think personally they don't need to hang the hat on him because they've got players like Ken they've got Dyer they've got a bit more balance to them now they don't feel as talismanic as perhaps last season and consequently I think they don't need to hang anything on them. I think they can keep letting him play with the freedom that he's been thriving with at the minute and the freedom he's been using as, as kind of his jet fuel to, to impact games. Uh, we got the uh, uh, League Cup semi today, Manchester City and Everton. Who you got in that one? Man City, yeah. I think. <laughs> um, I, again, for them, it's, it's and more importantly, Pellegrini, it's another opportunity to sign off with a, a trophy. And, if you have that opportunity, I think you have to take it. And I'd be amazed if he names anything but the strongest side possible, um, particularly because he's down a goal. And yes, he knows he's, he's got that goal. If he can secure a 1-0 win and take it to extra time, he knows he's, he's as good as gone. It's, it's important, though, that you remember that Everton are in atrocious form. And it's often when you're in atrocious form that you do the best in a cup competition. So there's every chance that Everton turn up and, and put a shock. But I... I it would be a shock. I think that's the best way I can put it. I'm fully expecting Man City to go through on this one. Yeah, I, you know, with uh, with with Everton involved in that game, it brings us very briefly here before I let you go, Christian, to the issue of Tim Howard's potential move uh, to, back to MLS. He's been uh, reported to be interested in 
it may be coming back uh, as early as this summer and joining the Colorado Rapids, who, from their perspective, I think it's an odd move. From Tim Howard's perspective, what do you make of it? There was someone on, on Twitter last night, I apologize, I can't remember the, who it was, who said, good friends don't let friends spend DP money on goalkeepers. <laughs> and I'm inclined to agree with that analysis, to be truthful. I, I, I personally think the quality of goalkeeper in MLS negates the need to spend designated player money on, on a goalkeeper. I think that would be better suited in another position of the spine of the team, be it a centre-back, be it a midfielder, or even a forward. Again, it's, it's a US international. I imagine it will sell tickets. It might even sell shirts. So if they're looking for a marketing boost, then it'll do the job. Whether it will improve them drastically on the field, I'm not too sure. I'm still surprised, personally, that Mas is the coach. I, I thought he was as good as gone last year. I didn't see anything to suggest that it was entirely the player's fault. I thought a lot of the decisions were his fault. I thought they played some some really low quality kind yeah. of boring soccer as well. You know the, the rapids. And, the rapids are fascinating, Christian, and, I, and I, we could totally break them down. And I agree with you. And I think it shows a lack of initiative on the part of the rapids that that Mastroeni is still there. And who buys a goalkeeper shirt? But the word is now out from uh, Jeff Carlisle at ESPN FC that the club in question with Matt Miazga is Chelsea. Uh, that's a surprise to you. It is. It is. I'm, I say that purely because I don't see him breaking into that side straight away. It's going to have to be a patient one. And equally, how good are Chelsea at developing young talent? Let's, let's be brutally honest about it. They've got something like 30 players out on loan. You look at Patrick Bamford, Bertrand Sorori, who's just left the club to go on another loan spell. Christian Atsu. There's so many young players that sign for that club and don't make it to the first team. And that's my concern if I'm Matt Miazga and, and it's representative which is what is the pathway to the first team for me on this one? If it's Swansea or Leicester, you can see it much clearer and that's no disrespect to, to the players there. It's interesting that today Gary Cahill says he feels like he's at a crossroads in his career. If they're really going to hang their hat on a 20-year-old Matt Miazga, that takes a lot of bottle and a lot of confidence in him and they must have seen things that really suggest he's, he's there. I personally raised concerns this morning saying I'm not sure if he's ready for this move just yet. I think he'll have to go to the championship and learn the hard way with some cold, wet afternoons in Brighton. After that, does he go in the first team? It's going to be a steep path for him. I, I really don't envy the journey he's about to make. It's going to test him in a lot of ways, and I hope he's ready for that. Is this? Is, do you, would you view this as an alternative to Stones after that whole saga? They're very different defenders. That's the, that's the difficulty. I mean, equally, they're totally different ends of the price scale as well. Yes, right. It's, it's, <laughs> that's true. It's a, it's quite literally a pair of Louis Vuitton shoes and some Payless shoes. That's the best way I can describe <laughs> well, it. Well, I mean, and that's not a slam on on that. No, no, no. Of course, incredibly talented. Of course. It, well, that they, they, they brings well. Okay, it remains to be seen because, of course, Matt Migazza has to perform. But that it could potentially, should he perform, and we know he's talented, potentially, potentially be relatively game changing. Although, look, there are reasons to go after English talent. I understand that. Of course, the the need for homegrown players is important as well. It fits a lot of other kind of little quotas that, that help keep things ticking over. <clears throat> it's never bad to have someone that is perceived as the future of English football as well. That's always good. Miyaka feels like a little bit more of a, an off-the-radar signing. I'm curious, unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever learn it, what the thinking is behind it, um, which sounds critical. I, I assure you it's not at all. It's just slightly left field for a club like Chelsea, yeah. and I'll be very curious to see kind of how things manifest for him in the next 6 to 12 months. I'm very kind of pleased for him in the same instance because I think it's great to see that a club like Chelsea is not only watching MLS, scouting MLS, but sees enough talent in someone to take him. Because again, we've had players go to the likes of Stoke and such like. That's one thing. Chelsea is just a different caliber altogether, and it's great to see him make that move. And I genuinely hope he succeeds. Yes, of course. You know, Chelsea. Uh... 
<laughs> this season uh, isn't living up to their to their uh, usual standards. But of course, we know where they're supposed to be. We know they where they want to be, and and we know we we expect them to get back to that level at some point. So certainly, it will be a challenge for Mabiaski to get playing time at a club like Chelsea. Uh, and lots of speculation on Twitter already from American soccer fans who just can't believe that this is a legitimate purchase of a talented player it's got to be this there's there's so much self-defeatism in american soccer christian oh so so matt meows is going to go on loan to a championship side and then be sold by 2018 you know stuff like that <laughs> no come on guys well, they have a they have another young american as well i think his name's kyle scott in the, the development squad so it's not completely unheard of i think what it is it, it it's just because matt's at a different point in his career in the sense that <clears throat> if he's making this move as a 20-year-old, you're wanting to see him play regular soccer. He's, he's been called up to the senior national team, so he's seen as an important thing. And, and when you're looking at, you talk about 2018, when you're looking at the 2018 World Cup, you're wanting him realistically to be starting in that. You want maybe him and John Anthony Brooks, maybe even Jeff Cameron as a more senior figure, Matt Beasley. You want Matt Miazga to be involved. And if he's going to a club where you're concerned about his playing time, you then have to look forward and say, well, how does that impact his potential World Cup in Russia? It's all of these little steps that, you know, you, you have to look forward to when, when a player makes this kind of move to see mm. how will this impact X, Y, and Z. Mm. Yep. Uh, Christian Hennett joining us on a uh, Wednesday talking about the Premier League and certainly Matt Miazga as we learn he is going to Chelsea. Christian, appreciate the time. Uh, lots to talk about. We just uh, we'll have to let it go here and maybe pick it back up at another uh, another point. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mate. There goes uh, Christian Hennage. Good stuff from him. Follow him on Twitter. K H E N E A G E. That's his Twitter handle. He writes on MLS and Premier League and all kinds of stuff. Soccer Morning WorldSoccerTalk dot com. When we come back, phone lines will be open. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to Soccer Morning on World Soccer Talk with Jason Davis. We're back on Soccer Morning. It is Wednesday, and I imagine that you people want to talk about Matt Miazga. Or at least that's one of the topics we can discuss here on a Wednesday morning uh, because Matt Miazga has been transferred to uh, Chelsea Football Club where he will compete for, for time with a, a host of talented players. This is a club, Chelsea, that not only had look, they, it, it's sort of easy to look at their first team roster and go, oh, okay, well, look at, look at who they got. An aging John Terry, uh, a, a, a Gary Cahill, who, appar- who apparently is questioning himself at this point. I don't know what cro- crossroads of his career, is, as, as Christian Hennig just, uh, just uh, put it out there. But they have a ton of guys out on loan. Uh, they have talented in, they have talent in that team. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Matt Miazga. Is this a purchase on the up and up? Meaning they see him as a potential player for Chelsea Football Club, or is this one of those situations where you know you you get him placed with your team and then you move him on at some point? There's a bunch of guys uh, in this uh, in in this uh, Chelsea group out on loan right now to various places that the Matt Miazga would have, would potentially have to compete with time for time. With and and we we will see whether or not uh, a loan is in the offing. What fairly or immediately? I don't know. We, we've got some. You know, it's a talented young player making a move to the Premier League. I think it, 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 without knowing what's going to happen, without without having the evidence of his play or lack thereof, then we need to wait. Okay, we need to see what comes from this move. Let's go to uh, Richard in Philly. What's up, Richard? Hey, Jason. How you doing? Uh, doing well, sir. What's on your mind? Uh, the MLS schedule kind of breaking news that came out this morning about the international dates. It's not breaking news. I mean, I know what you're, I know. Ta- I know it, what you're talking about, it, but it's not breaking news. But go ahead. Yeah, it, and it seemed, well, it's wild that it's not breaking news because it, it was breaking news to Paul Tuenio, who who did it. It was breaking yes. news to me. And right. then uh, and I agreed with all what um, they, oh, I forgot his name. I forgot his name. Darren Dar- Dar- Rollins said, is like, all these MLS just slipped it in, and like everyone knew, it was common knowledge that they could just that teams could choose to do not to deserve international dates. Yeah, so that, the, that, so the, that the um, kind of still MLS. So, so uh, what we're just talking about is Paul Tenorio, or, or Paul Tenorio had a story, or or there was a story down in Orlando, in which uh, Phil Rollins noted that uh, that MLS teams can choose to play through international breaks or decide not to now. You know, there's two teams involved in these games, so I don't imagine it's one team's unilateral decision. Although there may be something to like the home team having more say, of course. But so this was this. Phil Rollins said this, but we actually had heard. Some of us had, had noticed that this was part of a story about the construction of the uh, the MLS schedule posted by Ariel Castillo at the league website uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, it's pretty. It's it's pretty fascinating because. Now fans know if my team's playing, they have something to do with them playing through the break. Yes, and the other thing I got in part was when Antonio said it was, if so, that's because so since Orlando decided scheduled decided to observe the international dates, that means they have more midweek games. So it's kind of forced MLS. So kind of way it forced the MLS clubs. Okay, you have to choose either observe the international dates. Or plays me with games that we all know are death senses. Right. MLS, MLS teams. I, I, I do. I do think it's interesting that this is public now. Okay, because, because if only because again it shifts the it shifts the burden of responsibility from the league office to the individual club owners, who I think a lot of us have always identified as the driving force behind playing through the dates because they don't want to lose the the weekend gates. That's the issue. I mean that that's sort of what you're talking yeah. about, Richard. The, the, so now the owners have a decision to make. Look bad because we're playing through the international break, but maybe have a good gate, or you know, or play more midweek games and lose that on the gate, as you said. And then is also issues like I'm I'm of course I'm a union fan, so we have the issue of Andrew Blake being the starting goalkeeper for Jamaica, and there's a lot of there's, a, there's I won't say a lot, but there's some fans who are worried that if he gets caught up, then that's a lost game because we don't have the goalkeeper death now. As funny as that sounds. But well, we don't have the goalkeeper death because there was also the problem when Zach Pfeiffer got caught up to the U twenties. We lost him. There was times we figured out well, he, we should have kept him here. So now it's going. So now we're all worried. Like, wow, the union, the union should have took advantage of the dates to save Blake 
mm-hmm. from these from the Jamaica call ups. Yeah, it, it it now makes it a very interesting um, sort of um, uh, you know, formula as to how you go about running your seat. And again, I don't know how this plays out between. Like, I don't know if the the, the two teams have to get together and agree not to play, or if the home side, the home team gets to make the decision because a home team making the decision still pushes the away team into a midweek date more than likely. So I don't know how that works. And, and I mean, so it's one thing for the for for figures within the league to say. It's up to teams. In fact, here let me read directly from uh, from the the, uh, the piece at MLSsoccer.com in which this was um, this was dropped, sort of sort of like folded into the to the to the beginning of the year. Nobody really knew that this was coming. Um, hold on a second. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, FIFA dates are options. This is from. Hold on. This is from. Who's this guy? Brad Purcell, who's the vice president of club services and scheduling. Hey, Richard, I got to let you go, man. Your, your phone's terrible. Uh, FIFA dates are optional for clubs to play on. It's their choice. From a league perspective, we see the value in having them being honored, meaning no MLS games take place. But we ha- also respect that our clubs may want to play on those dates if they're not going to lose many players to call-ups. So uh, it's a very interesting situation there. Aaron in Jersey, you're on the air. Hey, uh, quick follow-up on the MLS uh, piece, uh, you know, uh, without doing much bashing here. But... Um, I, I, I guess I really don't understand why MLS doesn't want to take just a, a practical stand on this and just move the season, you know, if it means three, four more weeks, it, you know, it means three, four more weeks, but you keep your weekends, which everyone agrees is where you can make your money. And at the same time, you can honor, you know, the basic structure of international call updates which given the way MLS works with how big of a continent we have, it's probably not the worst thing in the world just to give teams little, almost like, almost like a buy, you know, like in football or yeah. in, in, in other sports. And, and because they don't do this, they're, they're always going to run into a problem signing any remotely potentially decent young um, Central American or, um, you know, Caribbean player who is going to want to play, uh, you know, you know, for their uh, country. And, you know, so, so we're going to wind up, it'll become the has been or could still be league for internationals and will be the conflict league for the U S players. You know, it it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. No, Um, I'm I'm with you on some level. I mean, again, the practical issues of of developing the schedule, I'm not going to pretend to know those, but I, I, I get what you're saying, Aaron. You know, and, and, uh, uh, one more thing on the on on the Premier League, uh, you know, I think there's this kind of tectonic shift going on in in clubs where, you know, kind of what used to work, you know, it's almost like corporations. It's, it's like what used to work is is being disrupted, kind of in a bottom up way. I yeah. mean, it's, it's this is all like the Dortmund, you know, Atleti type model where you kind of grab a few kind of developmentally strong senior level players and you kind of anchor them to, you know, a bunch of club developed players and you just work hard and you play smart, you know, kind of intelligent points driven games where you're, where you're just, you know, you're, you're driving to results. And I think, you know, Leicester city is just a great example of kind of Dortmund is in the premier league and it's not clock, you know, it's, it's, it's that type of play. And, uh, I, I I think play, I think clubs like Chelsea and Manchester United are just going to struggle for a long time. Interesting. I, mean, I, I think you know people just don't realize that you know it's not like year two of Man United struggling. No, no, you're I mean, right. And there's right. no. I'm sorry. No, it's it's okay. Go ahead. I got I got to move on. I got a bunch of calls on Matt Miazga, Aaron, but I do appreciate the the call. The dynamics changing in the Premier League certainly fascinating. Appreciate it, man. Sure, absolutely. Aaron uh, in Jersey talking about the Premier League. Let's talk to to Eddie in Brooklyn. About his boy Matt Miazga, what's up, Eddie? Hey, what's up? I will, I will say this about Miazga: of of all the players, the American soccer bubble hypes up, and you guys do get pretty carried away in hyping up players. Oh come on! Matt Miazga for me is the one that I think is the absolute real deal. I, I mean, I, the, I thought you guys There's completely so overhyped DeAndre Edlin. So much. Uh, I, you know, Brett Shea went over there. Nobody hyped oh, up Brett Shea. Another one, like nobody, a lot of Eddie, hype. Eddie, nobody hyped up Brett Shea. Come on. 
Nobody did that. Well, I mean, you know, people were excited about the move. Maybe, maybe they didn't hype him up, but they were hyped about Yedlin and and Agudelo about him going overseas, okay, especially sure. Yedlin. I thought Yedlin was the one. For the life of me, I couldn't understand it. The okay. the hype surrounding him, but the Miyaz the hype, I buy into fully. And it's not again, yeah, people can point to my Red Bulls bias, but I analyze the kid a lot. He he's an absolute dominant force. I always thought him next to Kendall Watson would be like the ultimate all-star center back pairing. Like you mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to, to, to do much, especially in the air. So I, for him going to Europe, maybe not Chelsea, but just he, it's time for him to go. In all honesty. How about this? So, so, so you're okay with the team selling him and then 5 million is a good number. I mean, you're going to have to sell him. Otherwise you're not going to get anything for him at right. the end of the season. Yeah, exactly. And look, I mean, if MLS is going to, Prove itself as a developer of talent's got to do stuff like this. It's got to it's got to get him at Miazga to a place like Chelsea again. Whether or not he sticks at Chelsea, I don't think that's something we should worry ourselves with right now. The fact that Chelsea came in and bought him is enough of uh, is enough of a thing. Now I know there's some hinkiness with his man, with his agent and and whatever, but still, it's it's still Chelsea. It's still the Premier League, and it's still a talented player who has a bright future. Agreed. The only problem with it being Chelsea is this is the same team that bought Michael Hector from Jamaica after the Gold Cup, and they loaned it back out to Reading. I mean, Chelsea is known for just signing players just to loan them out. You could actually put together uh, a starting eleven just based off Chelsea players that they've loaned out, and I wouldn't see why Matt Miazga wouldn't be one of them. I think maybe it's a little bit naive with people thinking that he's going to try and play straight away. I don't think that's going to happen no. anytime soon because if, if a guy like Michael Hector – who I thought is, is as dominant of course as a center back. Uh, and, you know, if, if he's getting loaned out to Reading of all places, you know, if he's getting back loaned out there, what kind of chance does Matt Miazga have? Well, we, we, we know at that level it's, uh, it's as much about consistent performances as, as individual talent. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, there's, there's really no reason to believe he's going to walk into the lineup or, or get legitimate minutes between now and, I don't know, uh, 2018. But, you know, there may be an opportunity for him to, to continue to grow. Uh, very briefly before I let you go, Eddie, uh, Alexi Lawless wants to know who you guys are. Who's you guys? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. A lot of guys who write, a lot of guys who write, a lot of guys um, who talk on podcasts that I listen to. Okay. A lot of guys who, um, who yeah, well, I mean, he doesn't have a podcast anymore. That big head head podcast is pretty dead. But, you know, I, I got my ear to the streets. Okay. It's not like it's not. Things <laughs> haven't been said. It's not, but you but you paint with a with a broad brush, Eddie. That's all I'm going to say. I know. No, I, know, I mean I, I just I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of tired of calling people out. I'm kind of putting that kind of put that on my New Year's resolution. I'm not calling specific names out, but you know they're out there. People that whose opinions I don't genuinely dis I don't respect. Uh, I don't agree with their soccer acumen. I'm just tired of calling people out. I've gotten into enough fights in my life, man. I'm not trying to do it. All anymore. right. All right. Yeah. It's a kinder, gentle Eddie from Brooklyn, man. I appreciate the call, Eddie. All right, man. Take there it easy. There goes uh, Eddie in Brooklyn. Let's, uh, let's get another Matt Miazga take from another Red Bull fan, Bill up in New York. What's up, Bill? How's it going, Jason? I have to say something there. Eddie, first, I hope he's listening right away. I want to thank him for the Pachuca game this weekend. He told me to watch it. Yeah. Because uh, Omar Gonzalez was on the team, and yeah. it, was, uh, it was a good game. All right, cool. a good game, I'll tell you. Really fast game. Omar looked a little slow to me, but uh, the whole game overall was a great game to watch. Okay, so but, uh, uh, so, so, so the, yeah. Go, Miyazga, go ahead. Is the five million? Is that set in stone or is that a rumor? Okay, that's that's what we're getting from. I think the Daily Mail put that out there. So uh, yeah, we're we're not sure about that. Je- Jeffrey Carlisle seems to think that's a little high, but that's the number that's been reported. That's what I think. You think that's high? I was going to ask you what you thought about that. You think that's that seems awfully high to me. I would think two million at a top three million. Okay, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, and try to judge the market, but go ahead. So for me, for uh, as a Red Bull fan, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> you have to trade him. I mean, if you're going to get five million dollars for this guy, a defender, you have to trade him. I, I think it's a great move on the Red Bulls' part. The only thing is, I'm watching this whole Red Bulls team now evolve a little bit going into the next season with Marsh, and it feels a lot like the second season with Pecky. Okay. It, it, it feels like we, we came off that season where we won the Supporter Shield, and now we're kind of sitting a little bit, and we're signing all these young players who are not proven, who we can't count on these guys, and, and we think we're going to get the same results as we got the first year, when I, I think everybody would agree, that first year, we couldn't have been any luckier. 
I mean, no injuries, you know, catching right in the bottle with some of the players that came out of nowhere. Yeah, I, I just, I'm hoping we're not setting ourselves up for a failure season here. And now we're starting to lose some of our players like Miazga. And I'm, I'm almost wondering if this is going down the same road as Packy from Mars. That's interesting. I mean, look, it's an evolution. You can't stand still. And I, and I think if, whether it's three million or five million or whatever, if Chelsea comes in and says, "We want to buy your talented young American player," and, and you're Red Bulls, and you've got you're, you're bringing through homegrown talent, and you're trying to become, um, you know, you're trying to become a team with a reputation for 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 developing players, I think you have to do this. Now I know what you're saying, though. I mean. You, you, selling Miazga is all fine and good, but how do you replace him? And how do you keep things going in the same positive direction you had last year? Yeah, that's it. This is a great move as long as they do something with it. If they sit on this money, then I really question it. You know, I, 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 I worry about the season coming up with us not really making any major steps forward except for all these young guys inside, which is good, but we, we need some... Uh, some real steady guys in here, and we don't seem to have that right now. And I hope they don't uh, sit on this money. I hope they use it. All Thanks, right. Jason. I'll talk to you. Appreciate it, Bill, in New York. Let's uh, let's go down to Austin, or let's go down out to California and talk to Austin. What's up, Austin? Hey, Jason. How are you doing this morning? Doing well. What's on your mind? Hey, so sorry to uh, change gears on you. Um, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, college scouting and the way that the MLS is going, trying to trying to make the switch to academies. Uh, I'm just I'm just curious. Uh, I'm I'm thinking about the the college the college scouting system and the semi pro scouting system, uh, and just kind of your your takes on that. I guess like what needs to improve, what doesn't. I mean, cause I, I'm I'm thinking in you know about players about like you know Joe Corona who now plays in Tijuana, and he's on the U.S. Men's National Team. I mean, he was playing in, uh, excuse me, he was playing in junior college, right, in San Diego, and then and then noticed how he's playing professionally in Mexico. I mean, it's people like him that are falling through the cracks that are getting noticed later sure. on. Sure. I, I think, you know, part of our problem uh, in this country is that there are, uh, there are already structures in place that are not necessarily built for identifying professional quality talent, what they're do- what they they're built to send kids to college. I mean, you know whether or not Joe Corona, uh, who played at, at yeah, who played at San Diego State, whether or not he's a, a player that they that MLS missed on or not, it sort of it depends on your viewpoint. MLS can't scout the entire country, right? So there there needs to be pockets of focus, and there, but there needs to be absolutely a special focus on areas where you're going to produce more talent. I mean, Joe Corona comes out of L.A. You would expect that that L.A., and look, getting a second team with a real program, not that Chivas didn't have a real program, but we know what their focus was, but getting a second team in L.A. will help. I mean, I I don't know if, in, in terms of methodology, I can't really give you anything, Austin, because I don't know how that works right now. But I will say that I think that too much of the funneling of talent is funneling in the wrong direction, and that and maybe the the the, uh, the the ability to see all of the kids play is something that's always going to be a problem because you can't you, again you just can't have enough scouts to cover the entire country. The, the Mexicans are the ne- Mexican clubs are going to come in, they're going to identify talent, they're going to take that talent down to Mexico. We'll lose some of those kids to the Mexican national team. Some of them will play for the USA, and that's just the way it's going to be because there's just too much here for one league or or two leagues to cover especially when they're still trying to make enough money to keep themselves going. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I totally agree with you right. 100%. Is there, a, is there a, I mean, I, I mean, I understand there's, there's way too much talent. Do you, is there a better way, you, you think? Uh, in, in a better way of identifying that talent? I mean, I think it's just, I, right. I mean, I think it's, it's, and I hate to do this because this is the disappointing, this disappoints people, but it's a matter of, Okay, it's a matter of having knowledgeable scouts, right? Like the, the more knowledgeable scouts you have, the more likely you are to identify the, the, the talent. Knowledgeable scouts come not for just from training, but from a culture that 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 that, that, that provides a sort of institutional knowledge. I mean, again, I, I, I'm just going to use a comparison here. And, 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 of course, baseball is in a different situation because Major League Baseball is the best league in the world and the, and the second best league over in Japan really doesn't compete with them for players. Um, the 
the the thing that happens in America is when you grow up and you play baseball or football or basketball or whatever, those things become ingrained in you. If you're an if you're an athlete, if you're a kid who plays, you know the rules and 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 what makes a good baseball player pretty much like in, inherently. You know what those those things are. Now there's stats and things can come into play and make a difference now, but you know you you know what a good baseball player looks like. You know what a good basketball player looks like. You know which skill sets translate to a kid going from little league dominating to uh, to a high school all star. That stuff hasn't in, that hasn't infected American sports culture on the soccer level quite as much as we need it to in order for us to identify the talent. I'm not saying there aren't people who know who 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 don't know soccer out there. I'm not saying there are, there aren't people who know soccer in the United States, Austin. I'm saying there aren't enough. And it's not part of our cultural knowledge base so that when you walk down the street or I walk down the street or any random person who grew up in America walks down the street, they know what a good soccer player looks like. That just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Hey, Jason, I appreciate your time right, this morning. Thanks a lot, Austin. Look, time is not something people want to consider, but it, it, time matters. And, and, and again, it's incumbent upon the leagues to stay extant, to get the teams to stay extant, so that more kids are more interested, so that then one day they're not just a potential player, but they're, but they're the potential coach or the potential guy who watches a kid play and calls up their buddy who works for the local soccer club and gets that kid a tryout. That stuff matters. Mark in New York, who's, uh, you're on there. What's up? Yeah, hi, Jason. I'm, I'm here to talk about Colorado Rapids and the future <laughs> of the no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Mark. No. How are you? How are you doing? I, I'm, uh, I'm, well, go ahead. No, no. I, o- overjoyed today. Overjoyed for Matt, who, you know, clearly wanted to go. Um, you know, reportedly he was offered a significant raise by the Red Bulls, and this is where he, he's, he was set, and good for him. I mean, the kid was the young uh, male player of the year for U.S. soccer, and there is absolutely going to be no better time for him to make this jump and, you know, $5 million, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how much the Red Bulls will recoup from that, and I don't know exactly what they'll do with it. Um, yeah, there are people in Red Bulls' world that are obviously a little bummed today to see Matt go. He's a really, really talented young player. Um, but in an age when there are fewer kind of – there are fewer uh, young, talented Americans playing their trade at the upper levels in Europe, uh, and when I mean Americans, I mean – and I don't want to start a firestorm here, but, you know, Americans that come out of MLS and not hyphenated Americans, I think this is great. And um, I think we all are rooting for him to continue yeah. to uh, grow his game, and it'll be good for the U.S. Men's National Team. Let, so let, let's, it's really true. Let's put on the record, Mark, just the couple of, of, of things that, that sort of um, pull us back a little bit from just being super excited here. because Because there are some things, okay? They just they bear mention. One of them is... His agent, Kia Jorabchian, who does not have the best reputation around the world, has been involved in some third-party uh, ownership schemes, is, is kind of a shady figure. Okay, That doesn't mean that this isn't a good move for Matt or that, that, that Kia is doing something wrong with Matt Miazga. I'm not saying that. Just putting this out there. This is who his agent, his agent is that facilitated this move to Chelsea. The other part of this is, and I actually don't think this is a negative, but some people are already viewing the fact that he's probably going to go on loan as a negative. He goes on loan, so what? He gets to play. That's he's still, Absolutely. you know. And look, Chelsea may Chelsea may view this as a sell on opportunity in the future. Uh, you know, we'll get Matt Miazga some minutes at a, a championship club, and we'll sell him for eight million bucks. That, that's fine too. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, I, there's nothing wrong with that, and that's how the the business of world soccer works. And so, when you talk about at least from the Red Bull standpoint, their model is develop young talent play it, hopefully win championships. Obviously, there's one that's eluded the club for all this time, but they have been a very strong club over the last few years. And then reap what you sow yeah. and sell them on an international market. Let, let, I, I think this is how this is supposed to work. And when you talk about I know that there were some Rebel fans that were lamenting uh, the status of the team as a feeder club. But, you know, short of 12 clubs around the world, everyone is a feeder club. Right. Their yeah. entire nations, whose entire national leagues yeah. are feeder clubs. Yeah. You know, France, uh, XPSG, uh, all of Holland, which is a, you know, a quality league. Um, Portugal, right? Yep. So there are... Belgium. Uh, yep. <laughs> Belgium, right. So, I mean, this is part of the evolution of the league. And, you know, obviously they're, they're, the history is right with stories of 
uh, young Americans who go over there and uh, don't really pan out. Some of them pan out and then come back for a big payday in MLS maybe a little bit sooner than yeah. some people would have liked. You know, I don't, I'm going to be in danger of painting a bit of a false dichotomy here, but I do think that this is interesting, uh, the sale of Miazga and sort of the discussion of, of MLS as a feeder league or a league that develops some talent and, and sells it on. In light of, of, of a, a story I read, which is probably against my better judgment, yesterday about China and the rafts of money that are being spent on players over in China, um, specifically on on Brazilian players, and now um, Gervinho moving from AS Roma to a Chinese uh, side, and, and being painted as though China is leaping ahead of MLS in the in the Come race on. to be a relevant league in this world because they're spending again racks of money on sort of. Uh, Brazilians who are chasing the dollars, but also some other players who are, are doing the same from around the world. And again, I, I, it's, it's a false dichotomy because MLS is certainly spending a lot of money on aging Europeans. But I don't know that either, you know, I don't know that, that this necessarily means that uh, China, China's spending money necessarily means that China's doing it right or, or even that MLS is doing it right necessarily. It's just, it is fascinating to see what's happening here because China's finding, trying to figure out a way to develop talent. They're, they're, sponsoring whole leagues and demanding roster spots. The United States slowly but surely, and Canada too, slowly but surely, developing players like Matt Miazga who are sold on to clubs like Chelsea. That's 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 it's a remarkable thing, even if we don't know the future. Well, and, and let's be honest, though, you know, given the fact that the um, the rules are concerning work permits and things like that have seemed to have tightened over the last yes, few years, right. this is hopefully the start of the next wave that started with the Andrew Yedlin and now continues with Matt Miazga. I mean, let's not think about guys like Bradley and Dempsey, who basically did this seven, eight years ago when they were still ascendant young players in their careers, and you know, to a lesser extent, Josie. Uh, but you know, here are guys who applied their trade, in the case of Bradley, probably at the highest possible level that an American has played in over a decade, both yeah. since the likes of Claudio Reyna mm -hmm. and John Hart and people like that, as a you know, the class of 1990, if you will. But, I mean, we, we obviously need to be doing more of this. I mean, you talk about China and development. I mean, we're, we're decades ahead of China. If they want to bring in, um, you know, 15 different Brazilian superstars on each of their, you know, club teams in order to show the way, and it's another way to do it. But, I mean, I, I don't see too many Chinese uh, plying their trades in the great clubs of Europe. And, yes, I, I think over the last seven to eight years are – contribution there has taken a little bit of a step back. Um, but again, you know, Nedlin has struggled. Obviously, we want to see him do better. Um, Miazga, I can't imagine, is going to play for the first team anytime soon, although it's Chelsea called towards the relegation zone. Who knows? But, you know, it, it's great. It's great for the league. Um, Red Bull fans are very concerned about the strength of their back line this year with guys like Damian Parnell and Norman Zubar. Parnell, who's coming back from ACL surgery and, and Zubar, who didn't show a ton last year. Um, yeah, the, the team did dra uh, draft a couple of young college kids. They do now have one open roster spot. I think Red Bulls fans who are anticipating a huge center back signing to help fill the gap here, I think maybe barking up the wrong tree given everything the clubs have saying in the last few years. But nevertheless, you know, it's a, it's a great day. Um, agent, quality of uh, agent aside, uh, it's great for Matt, and hopefully it'll be great for the U.S. Basketball. Mark Fishkin joining us uh, on Soccer Morning. A little Matt Miazga talk. Make sure you check out Seeing Red. Hey, Mark, uh, thanks for the time, and uh, and we'll see what happens. Hope the hope the best for Matt Miazga. There you go. Thanks so much, Jake. There goes Mark. Good stuff from him, as always. Let's take a break. Actually, that's not a break. Let's wrap up this show. We're at the end of things. Thanks so many callers. I got my head turned around. Let's uh, let's step aside. Thank you very much for for listening today on a Wednesday. By the way, remember uh, we are in our last week of our partnership with uh, World Soccer Talk. That doesn't mean much for you if you're a iTunes subscriber or you get the show through one of the podcatchers that are out there. Uh, especially if you listen live, it, it shouldn't change things other than you go to the YouTube feed or you go to Backhill.com. All right, that's it. I I'm out. I, I gotta go do another show. Oops. I gotta go do Sirius XM where we're gonna talk a lot about Matt Miazga. I think if you have it. Join me over there. See you later. Bye.